fast week, it was definitely the, the stage that I finished seven and I managed to, to go in the break at the end of the race to be there in the front with the best rider and have a chance to win the stage was uh, really nice for me. It was the first time uh, I was able to ride a move like this and be uh, that strong uh, in the front of the race. So I really, really enjoyed that and I'm really happy uh, with that uh, with that day. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, editor of the magazine and your host. You just heard from Ugo Uhl of Astana Pro Team speaking about one of his high points at this year's Tour de France. It's been a busy September. The Tour recently wrapped up, Torino Adriatico before that, and the World Championships are a few days away. We'll hear from Uhl with his look back at the Tour and look ahead to Worlds. Michael Woods will provide insights into the race of two seas and the upcoming championships. Throughout the tour, I checked in with Uhl. It was his second time at the French Grand Tour. He seemed to play a bigger, stronger role for his team Astana this year. We'll hear him talk about echelons, spreadsheets, and crashes. Michael Woods won a stage at Torino Adriatico and held the leader's jersey for two days. Both riders are slated to represent Canada at the Road World Championships on Sunday. They'll tell us what we might see on the circuit in Imola, Italy, and of their hopes on how the road race might play out for them. First, let's hear from Uhl. He and I spoke on the tour's first rest day, which, of course, featured COVID-19 testing. We're speaking on the first rest day of the Tour de France, part of the rest day plans are COVID-19 tests for all teams and their staff. Have you received your test? Yeah, I did the test this morning. It's really quick. Uh, we have to go at a specific time slot every team so we don't see each other. And there's, I think, uh, eight or nine station. You get the, the test done and uh, they did all our team in about 10 minutes and we were out. We could go on the ride and just uh, easy and now uh, have the afternoon to rest. You had a false positive in mid-August that prevented you from racing in Lombardia. Do you have confidence in the testing and the policies here at the Tour? Yeah, I think uh, the the ISO uh, organization is aware of this. They can have some mistakes. So if you don't have any symptoms they will, uh, and you get a positive test, they will do uh, another test and some more investigation before taking any decision. That is an update on the protocol, I think. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we have to do some testing and uh, nothing can be perfect. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to test and I totally agree with this. This is your second tour. It's quite different from your first. So much has changed in a year, more than a year. But how would you compare racing in France in late summer instead of in early summer, which is the regular time for the Tour de France? Well, I mean, it's it's better for me. I don't. I'm not a big fan of the the big big uh, heat. I would say it's different because okay, this year is the COVID also, so there's less spectator. The atmosphere is different. I believe it's in July where everyone is in vacancy, happy, and doing a party. So the tour is like a big uh, big party all over France uh, to 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 see the the race and it's part of the culture. So uh, we feel a little bit less this year because the protocol we need to respect and uh, it's totally fair. Plus, uh, out of the weather, uh, yeah, so far it's, it's quite good, but we could have more rainy day and uh, cold in the mountain, but so far it's good. We'll see with the big uh, mountain uh, stage when we go uh, higher. You finished 15th on stage one. How was that final kilometer for you? Well, I was pretty lucky. I went on the good side of the road. I went in the wheel of the Jumbo Visma with uh, Granazzi just to stay safe. Honestly, I didn't have uh, in mind to do the sprint. And then when that big crash happened, at, uh, I think uh, a little bit inside, three k to go. Then we were only 40, 40, 50 guy in a bunch. So I said, oh, now I'm lucky. I can, I can do the sprint. But there, it was still uh, quite a lot of uh, chaos because it was not so much organized. So there was... People moving from the left and the right and the left. And then, yeah, I just tried to stay careful because I know my fitness was good and uh, I didn't want to end up in a stupid crash uh, trying to, to sprint because I'm not a real sprinter. So uh, I have 
get in the front on a few stages. There was a sprint, but there was always crash that I could escape. And after I just followed the wheel and I ended up, I was in the front. But uh, yeah, I had a bit of luck there and uh, just uh, managed to, to be in the good wheel at a good moment and uh, finish it up in front. On stage six, your teammate Alexei Lutsenko won. What was your role in the success? Well, I mean, uh, it was uh, pretty easy for us. Alexei went in the breakaway uh, after six or seven K. And uh, just, yeah, at the beginning, I, just, I was just there to keep an eye on it. It was him and Gorka need to get in the break. Uh, there was, I think, five or six guys in the front at that moment. And Alexei just attacked on top of a uh, false lap. He was in the break and behind, yeah, we just take it easy. And uh, my job was to take care of uh, Lopez to place it uh, well at the bottom of the climb. But... Uh, on that day, I have to say that Alexi uh, make his victory by himself, and uh, we uh, didn't have to contribute uh, so much to it. It's all uh, all uh, all him uh, with a really strong leg and an amazing ride uh, on that day to get a solo victory. It was great for the team. So since then, we have a, a good momentum, and uh, everyone is happy. So it's always good to to win a, a stage early. How did the team celebrate that evening? Well, we uh, came to the hotel really late, so uh, it was a bit of a rush. We got a little glass of champagne around uh, 9.45 after some guy uh, had to go to massage because they didn't have time before we eat. So it was a, a long transfer after the stage and uh, about uh, two hours and a half. So we came late, so there was nothing really uh, special, but we need to stay focused on the recovery always, but just... Uh, a glass of champagne all together and uh, enjoy that moment a little bit. And then uh, everyone was back to uh, the room to uh, to make a recovery. So only a small moment, only a small glass of champagne, nothing to uh, take away from your, your preparation and your focus. Yeah, exactly. The next day, stage seven, uh, from Melo to Laval, you did a lot of work in the final 30 kilometers or so after the, the group split again. Tell me more about that strategy. Why was it important for you and your team to be so active in that final 30 kilometers? I mean, uh, when a uh, national happened like this, uh, there's never a place for who we want. So as we have uh, almost all the team in the front, seven riders out of eight, uh, it was all in, in our favor to, to push the pace and try to make some gap. And at the end of the day, we uh, gained some time on the GC contender like Landa, Pogaja. As we were in a uh, good position uh, in the front, so we just decided to go help uh, Granati at the time, and we we push the pace up, and uh, John Bovisma also helped the chase. So basically, uh, asked me to ride as hard as I can until the finish line to to keep the gap and uh, put pressure on the other team. Yeah, that's what uh, I was there for, and I'm really happy I could uh, could be in that first echelon and be uh, a good uh, good actor of that stage and ride in the front. It was a uh, Really nice moment. My, 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 you know, most of the time, sometimes we uh, we get screwed in an echelon, but uh, for that time, it was me in the front, so that was uh, that was good. You still had the energy to finish 11th on that stage. How were you able to do that? Well, I mean, I was in the front, and uh, the rider, they, they respect me because I was riding, so I could uh, hold a good position by the end, and uh, it was not easy to move up, and I was in the good wheel, so I just keep following and try to do a small sprint at the end. Uh, yeah, I'm I mean, I was I was tired, but I still have a, a little bit more left, so uh, just give it a go. So far in the tour, you finished in the top 20 on four stages, um, including that 11th on stage seven. How is it different uh, in the finish among, say, the riders in places 10 to 20 compared with the sprinters who are going for the win? Well, I mean, from 10 to 20, nobody cared about it, so uh, <laughs> it means nothing for us. <laughs> And uh, you have to think that may not, may, most of the team, when they have a really good sprinter, you do your work and you just uh, pull over and you, you stop. So in, in the case of Astana, we don't have any sprinter, so we just stay in the wheel and follow. We don't have so much work to do. We just take care of Lopez. So that's why, okay, we end up in the top 20 because we have no specific uh, roles or something. So it's easier to, to get some results. So for you, whether you finish 11th, 15th, I don't know, 20, you don't, it doesn't really matter so much for you in those places? No, not really. You have to be really close to the front to to consider it. It depends on which day, when it's a really big climbing day, then okay, if you finish 10th on the Tour de France on the mountain stage, and uh, you weren't the front with the best, it means it mean something, but the sprint, it's, yeah, it's different. On stage eight, what was it like going up uh, the Col de Perisode? 
How did you feel about the fans on that climb? Were they too close? Some of them were really close and they don't wear the mask. We cannot control everything, but uh, ISO is doing a really good job to make sure that uh, minimize that kind of uh, stuff to happen. But of course, you cannot control everyone everywhere. But uh, they're doing a really good job. And uh, as a rider, we just have the plan to wear the mask and uh, keep uh, a good distance between us so we can uh, yeah, be safe and uh, keep racing until the end to Paris. My next chat with Ul was on the second rest day. He seemed pretty chill. As the tour had gone on, the riders had settled into the rhythm of the long race. Ul noticed less fighting for position within the bunch. The racing, though, was still on. Ul looked back on a big stage 12. He was in a selective breakaway that had some pretty big names in it at times, such as Julian Alaphilippe and Pierre Roland. Ul finished 7th on the stage. And that week's bummer was a crash. How has your rest day been? Oh, the rest day has been uh, really good. I uh, enjoy it a lot. Uh, we start the more this morning with a PCR test again. And then a uh, small ride, 45 minutes. and uh, Sorry, 45k, one hour and a half. There's some, uh, some activation, uh, sprint and uh, work just to to keep the engine going a little bit tomorrow we have a hard stage so i want to to stay uh keep the body awake and after that uh, just come back to the hotel have a nap good massage or still and uh, i'm almost ready to go heat again how does it feel uh within the tour when outside around france there are cases of covid19 and they're going up and up in my case i don't look at this uh, at all uh, I feel pretty safe in the bubble. I have uh, not any contact with anyone outside of the race. So uh, I feel safer here in the race than at home because uh, I don't have to go to groceries. I don't have to go anywhere. So uh, everyone around me is doing tests. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm really uh, happy we can race and uh, be in a safe environment with uh, the big work of uh, ISO. Tour de France organization is doing a good job. And uh, I think the uh, two and chase uh, this coronavirus case going up the uh, strength measure for the weekend. As you can see, there was no spectator in the climb. There's less and less people on the start area, finish area. We're completely alone. Yeah, it feels uh, it feels uh, totally safe and uh, it didn't uh, feel the difference uh, at all. How does the second week of the tour compare with the first week of racing? I would say that the second week starts to be a little bit more uh, relaxed. Relaxed not by the speed of the racing or the the, the race was really hard, uh, even harder than the first week. I think we went uh, much faster. Uh, a lot of things were really hard with the fight against the Bola for the sprint and they push a lot of stage. But I would say uh, the last few days, there's less fighting uh, in the bunch for the position. Everyone starts to be more tired. It's more uh, a little bit more uh, easy to uh, to ride in the bunch and everyone sort to be tired and they don't fight as much as uh, the first week for the position and it's just going to get uh, even better on the third week. What was the best part for you of the past week of racing? Ah, the past week it was definitely the, the stage that I finished seven and I managed to go in the break or, uh, the, to, to go in the break at the end of the race to be there in the front with the best rider and have a chance to win the stage was uh, really nice for me. It was the first time uh, I was able to ride a move like this and be uh, that strong uh, in the front of the race. So I really, really enjoyed that. And I'm really happy uh, with that uh, with that day. And what was the most frustrating part of the past week? Uh, I would say crashing uh, because one guy dropped a bottle on the floor, uh, on the floor, on the road, uh, while I was uh, taking some feet. So I lost my handlebar and I just crashed. Uh, it's, yeah, it's never good to crash. So that was the moment when I was, I was kind of pissed. I'd say I could have avoided it. And, uh, but at the end, there were no, no major consequences. But uh, yeah, it's never nice for, uh, for the body to go down and get some, some scratches. And uh, you need one or two days to, to recover a little bit. So 
that. That was the moment I was a bit uh, a bit shocked. That was on stage 14, and I think it was Oliver Nason who maybe uh, made a mistake in the feed zone. Have you have you forgiven Oliver Nason for that? Yeah, yeah, I know him well. I'm no, I know he didn't do wanted to make anything bad. So uh, what happened happened. It can also happen that I do the uh, same mistake. So uh, there's no no big deal. It's part of the race. He apologized to me. I know him quite well, and we we still friends. So it's no matter. Tell me what it's like being the only Canadian on Team Astana. Are you are you a bit of the diplomat? Uh, what you mean by a diplomat to make uh, everyone uh, be happy together? Or? Maybe that, or maybe just connecting people. Um, you're also a bit of a road captain. So what's it like being in that, that kind of leadership role? Yeah, here it's a bit different. Normally we have more nationality, but here it's a strong uh, Spanish team. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I try to keep the guys together and make the good call at the right moment so we can stay in the front. Yeah, make a, a good race for Miguel that he showed that he's, uh, he's there to win the race or at least try to win and uh, be in the podium in Paris. So he deserves a, a good team around him. And so the, my job is to uh, just to keep everyone on the same line and uh, working well together uh, so we can uh, help Miguel at the best and uh, make sure we have... Uh, yeah, good communication and everyone is riding uh, well together as a team. A lot of work that you do is off the bike. You study maps, you, you look at uh, the race book, and you're also looking at spreadsheets every day um, for your own personal health and nutrition. How much work do you do with <laughs> the books and the computer each day? Oh, it's hard to tell. I would say I use at least 30, 35 minutes to... Uh, to do the road uh, road check, yeah. For the nutrition part, I I've done a lot uh, already. Like before the tour on the rest day, I took maybe one hour and I fill all the stage, all the information I need to to make my calculation. So after it's only maybe five or ten minutes a day, I just put the data up to date uh, that my power and uh, what I eat, I update. But it goes uh, it goes quite fast. So maybe forty five minutes. I want to keep it simple uh, to have the as less as possible to do because the day goes uh, pretty quick and sometimes we come late and uh, all things like this. So I don't want to waste uh, too much time on uh, on this just to be relaxed and uh, enjoy the day. Do you tape uh, stage notes to your handlebars or anything like that? Yeah, we have all, every day from the team director some uh, yeah, some information, but it's basically what is on the book, like the top of the climb, the feed zone, all those type of information. But normally, uh, when I see important thing on my uh, on my like uh, recon of the course, then uh, on the on the video viewer application, then I kind of also keep my personal note. But so far, I just keep in my mind like it's pretty easy. It's probably two, three key points, two, three kilometer I need to remember. So I keep it in my mind. But uh, sometimes I, I, I used to do my home bar tape, but here in the tour, we have the director doing it for us. But I, it's sometimes better when you do it. So you, you remember well. And what are your hopes uh, for yourself in this final week of the tour? I would like to get in a uh, in breakaway again and um, to see uh, tomorrow how it goes or the other day. If I can see an opportunity, try to 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 get it, yeah. And then out of this is going to be to help Miguel at the best, to so he can finish on the podium of the Tour de France. That that's going to be it. But uh, so far, I already did a a good Tour de France, so I'm going to this third week uh, pretty relaxed. I already made a, a lot of good things, so I'm not too stressed. My tour is already a success. So uh, if I can add a little bit to that, then fine. If not, uh, focus on Miguel and. Uh, Make sure you can uh, jump on the podium in Paris. Miguel Angel Lopez, the team leader who Wool was working for, did make it into third place overall after winning the 17th stage. But Lopez's performance on the final time trial took him down to six. I spoke with Wool after the tour was over. For the Canadian, it had gone pretty well. He was tired. And he had to rest for the World Championships a week after the Grand Tour ended. 
So where are you right now? I am leaving service goes from uh, Astana Pro team that is in uh, Karas behind me. The tour ended two days ago. How do you feel right now? Well, I feel I feel quite good. Uh, of course, I'm a little bit tired, but uh, so far it's, it's quite good. Yesterday I was tired uh, from the traveling, coming home, but today uh, I feel better. Yeah, no, I feel good. What kind of rides have you done in the past few days? Uh, yesterday I did nothing, and today one hour and a half, uh, easy, just in the legs. And then uh, tomorrow I'm going to do a better workout. On the last day of the tour, uh, you wore a mask, and on the front of the mask it was written, No to Racism. Who wrote that? Uh, it's uh, Every rider was free to do it. Uh, it's something we discuss in the CPA group uh, that hold the rider. I want to, uh, to put the support for this uh, cause that is a uh, hot topic now in the world. It just uh, was a small uh, way to express, you know, uh, that uh, we uh, support that. And then uh, cycling, especially in Asana Pro team, we have a lot of nationality. And uh, no matter from where you are, whatever the color you are, we are all on the same page with the same right. And, uh, Again, it was uh, up to uh, each team to participate or not, and uh, every rider could do it or not, and uh, I choose to, to, to do it, and uh, I'm the person who writes this on my mask by myself. How would you compare your first tour with your second that just wrapped up? I was a little bit stronger, I think, this year. I could do some a little bit more work, better in uh, positioning in the bunch, but uh, okay, it was more than the same. I think I finished in better shape now. Last year I was quite sick at the end, uh, coughing a lot. It wasn't the limit, but I came uh, last year to the Tour de France uh, a lot uh, more with a lot more fatigue in the body than I was this year. Uh, I think it was the right thing to do because the Tour was really hard this year again. Would you do anything differently if you were to race the Tour again? Would you do anything differently for your next Tour de France? Uh, absolutely not. I think uh, I know how to get ready, and uh, I know I, I start to know quite well my body. I have done a few Grand Tours so far, and uh, especially for the last year, I went to the front, so very confident. I know how, what I need to do before and also in the race to, to be sure that uh, I can perform at a good level. Uh, the last two editions that I was racing, I was feeling quite good, and I think uh, the plan works well, so I won't change uh, too much for the next coming game. How do you think all the kilometers in your legs will affect your rides at the time trial and the road race at the World Championships? Uh, I took the decision that I will not race the time trial because it's too close and I want to stay home for one week now and rest. So uh, I won't race in the time trial. I think uh, I'm going to be in really good shape uh, in road race because uh, if I recover well, then after a grand tour, you have a, a big benefit from it. You get a lot of power and more endurance. Usually after a Grand Tour, I'm, I'm really efficient one or two weeks after. If you rest well and I just do a little bit of training to keep the fitness high. So I expect that everything will go well this weekend and I can be uh, there for Michael Wood and uh, that we can make a great result for Canada. How does a circuit race like the one in Imola, Italy, differ from a more point-to-point course? Are the strategies and tactics different? Yes and no. At the end, uh, I would say no because, okay, it's, it's a race. There's always a, a, a point where, you know, it's where it's going to happen. But when it's a circuit race, like it's going to be in the Mona, everyone knows perfectly the course, know exactly where it's going to be the hill after 10 laps, then you know exactly how it works, you know. So there's no surprise on the, the course, you know. You're going to be behind and get a surprise or whatever. You know where you're going. Quickly, the team would race same way than if it's, a, it's not a circuit. Uh, in the case of Imola, sometimes the circuit race, uh, you need to be more attentive because there's more turn. In it. But Imola, I think it's not so bad from what I remember in the Giro when I raced. So for example, if you race a race like Quebec or Montreal, it's more hard because you need to fight for position all day and uh, be focused all the time to make sure you, you hold a good position and this way you can save a lot of energy. But Imola, I don't think it's super, super technical for position. But uh, when it's uh, straight for 100k, it's way easier than a circuit race where you need to position yourself and always be aware of the turn coming up. So it's, uh, it's even harder circuit race. But it depends, you know, you have a race point to point with a lot of small roads, climb turns, uh, and then it's the same thing. What are your hopes for the World Championships? 
Well, I hope uh, I can be there uh, really close to the end with Michael Wood and uh, play my role uh, to perfection to place him in the best position to to get a medal and even be the world champion. He showed in Sweden a year ago that he was in uh, really good shape. So uh, hopefully I can be at the best and uh, make a really big uh, race for him and uh, have an impact on the, the result uh, at the end. Well, thank you, Hugo. Good luck at Worlds. And uh, yeah, we'll be cheering. Thanks. Ciao. The other Canuck who had a big stage race in September was Michael Woods. He had great results at Torreno Adriatico. I spoke with him after the race. He was at his place in Andorra. It was evening for Woods. You'll hear birds chirping and a church bell ringing in the background. Woods spoke about what Torreno Adriatico revealed to him as a rider and why a circuit, instead of a point-to-point race, will be a boon to him at the World Championships. Michael Woods, at the start of Torreno Adriatico, what was your cold, honest assessment of what you could accomplish in that race? Well, before the start of the stage, I did an interview and I said my big goal was to try to get a podium at the race uh, in the overall or a stage win. And I felt like prior to this race, I had done really well in terms of my preparation. However, I just was missing race days at uh, Milan San Remo. Uh, Strabianchi, I had some bad luck. And then finally at Lombardia, I was good, but I just was missing that race exposure, that race experience. And it meant I came apart. So I, I, my confidence was a bit shaken after Lombardia, but I still knew I was fit and I still knew I had a good shot at getting a result in uh, Torino. On stage three of Torino, what did your attack tell you about your rivals? So this is the attack at the bottom of the climb. I knew what, after recon, after looking over the stage and even riding that stage, because uh, we did the climb twice. So we did it as a circuit and we did it one time prior to going up the final time. I knew it was super steep. And when grades are that steep and I can stand, I have a lot of confidence. I told myself after doing the first time up the, the, the mural, I was 1K to go. I wouldn't think of anybody else. I'd just go to the front and go as hard as I could all the way to the top. Regardless of what my competition was doing, I just wouldn't think about what they were doing. After about six, 700 meters, I started to see gaps open up behind my wheel, but I still didn't look back. I just looked forward. Even after I got over the top of the climb, I never looked back. I just kept on pushing, uh, knowing that uh, if somebody was able to stick with me, uh, we would still have a gap and keep. we'd need to keep momentum going. But yeah, I was made, able to to distance everybody, actually. You came into the final kilometer with Rafael Mica of Bora Hansgrohe. Who had done more work in the break at that point, just as you saw that uh, you had one kilometer to go? I think it was relatively even. Maybe Mica was pushing a bit more. I was confident in my sprint, and so I knew that I had a, probably had a better kick than Mica, and even Mica admitted that to me in the move. So I knew he was more interested in focusing on his GDC aspirations and personally I with with there being a time trial in this race I knew that I likely wasn't going to win the thing so I was more focused on winning the over winning the stage and yeah I, I was able to lean on that a bit more but uh, it was I'd say it was probably 60 40. Behind you your teammate Tanel Kangert uh, was in the group what was his role at that point? Well at that point Tanel was also riding a GC race as well and he managed to hang on and make that second group. And I was fortunate to have him in that second group because he just kind of helped disrupt the pace of the peloton. Uh, when he was coming to the front, obviously he wasn't pulling or pulling super slow. And that resulted in uh, a bit more a bit more disruption, a bit of delay. And ultimately every second counts when you're trying to keep a gap. That certainly impacted the gap that we had. On stage four... It was up to you and your team to defend the leader's jersey. What was that like? Special. I actually really focused on enjoying that moment, cherishing that moment. It was my first leader's jersey at a World Tour race. And uh, such a cool race, too. I started thinking even that I might have a shot at carrying it to the end. Yeah, it was just nice. And 
the team rode so well. We were so strong that day. I was strong. Came over the the set the last real climb of the day, uh, just with Yates and Garen Thomas, and was felt like I could answer any of their moves, and was able to out sprint them at the finish. We had a bit more of a select group. I think I had the shot of winning the stage, but just overwhelmed by Mitchelton's numbers on the on the on that stage. So uh, it, was, it was a nice day, and to even take uh, the king of the mountain jersey as well on that day was was cool. Near the end of that stage, Lucas Hamilton of Mitchelton Scott and Fausto Masnada of De Quick Quickstep were ahead of your group, and they had a gap similar to what you had the day before, about 15 seconds. What calculations were you making at that point in the race? Well, for me, I knew I had significant time on both guys, and I wasn't concerned about them on the climbs moving forward. If I was going to be on, if I was going to have the form that I had the day previous, on the day following, I wasn't worried about those guys. And so I was fine with letting them go and focusing on just trying to get the last bit of bonus seconds and not letting uh, guys like Karen Thomas, guys like uh, Rafa Micah, guys like Simon Yates get away. Stage five, how did you think that final climb would go up to Sassoteto? Certainly a lot better than it did. I felt like going into that climb, I was really confident, really feeling like I was the strongest climber in the race. The team rode exceptionally well for me that day again. However, I wasn't. I had a bad day. Came apart halfway up the climb. Uh, I was actually a bit surprised by the legs that I had. I just wasn't the guy, the rider I was just the day previous. Is there anything you could have done differently, do you think? Maybe we could have ridden the climb just a bit less hard. But uh, yeah, I, I even at the start of the, the climb felt pretty good. I knew that I, if I wanted to go after the overall, I had to put even more time into leaders. So I, I was pushing for it to be a hard pace. But uh, some days you just don't have in the World Tour, and that was the day I just didn't have it. What does your performance at uh, this Torreno Adriatico tell you about the rider you've become? At the end of last season, I was really, really felt like I arrived at the World Tour in terms of a, a leadership role. I felt like the team could ask me to race most races and I could lead and and potentially win. I was really understanding how I could win. But then at Paranis, I just had a really bad injury, uh, broke my femur. After having such a significant injury, everything gets thrown into question a bit. My fitness, I was able to get back, and I was even able to prove that fitness at the virtual tour and show that I was putting out good numbers. But a crash like that still shakes your confidence and your your, your peloton skills. So the Torreno uh, win was on stage three, it was more just a, a, a success in the sense that I was able to come back and get back to where I feel like where I was at the end of last season and just give me that confidence that I can be at the, uh, at the top of the game uh, in the World Tour. How do you hope uh, your fitness or your abilities develop into the rest of this compressed season? Yeah, it's such a tricky season, such an interesting season. But I think the stars are really aligning for the World Championships. I don't think I'm the favorite. Just watching guys like Wout Van Aert and Al Philippe at the Tour, they're certainly quite strong, particularly Wout Van Aert. I think he's the hands-down favorite. But I do think that uh, the way I performed on Stage 3, of course, that will be quite similar to Imola. I have a lot of confidence and I think I can do something, a good result there. Let's talk a bit more about the World Championships. It's a this year's course is a circuit, and you're pretty familiar with a circuit race, having raced in Quebec and Montreal uh, four times. What does a circuit race, or what can that tell you about how the World Championship road race might play out in Imola? Yeah, I think that people are checking about how difficult this race is going to be, and it is going to be difficult, but it's not going to be as difficult, I think, as a lot of people are prognosticating. I think you look at the original course that was planned in Aigle, and I think that was a much more challenging course, more of a climber-oriented course. This is going to be more oriented towards a guy that can get over really difficult climbs but can also sprint from a very, select, very very select group, which was why I'm thinking guys like Welp and Art will be good. But the other thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to is, as you mentioned, it being a circuit race. I think anytime there are circuits, I do better than just classic point-to-point stages of races because it, I, I'm not from Europe. I'm from Canada. I don't know the roads as well as a lot of guys who have raced in Europe since they were kids. I don't know how the roads are going to play out as well. I haven't raced on every single road in France or Spain or, or Italy like some of these guys have. Anytime we go from point to point to 
uh, transition to more of a circuit race, I tend to flourish. I tend to do a lot better because all of a sudden the, the playing ground, the playing fields leveled a bit. I don't have to know every, every bump in the road uh, prior to the stage because I see it a couple of times and then I'm able to handle my bike better within the group. I'm able to position myself better. So for me, I get really excited anytime we get to do circuits. That's a, an angle I hadn't considered before, but you're right. Some of those Euro pros have like every speed bump and roundabout memorized, but um, yeah, everybody gets to see the course a few times at a circuit race. So that is a bit of a leveler. Exactly. And I find because I have to adapt in the non-circuit environment more than the guys that know the course. I have to ride the course uh, in a point-to-point course differently than them. It even plays into my hands more once we hit circuits because those skills that I had to learn doing blind, all of a sudden the the blindfold's taken off and I'm employing these tactics that save a lot of energy while also knowing the circuit. And uh, yeah, I I always love that feeling. Michael, thank you for your, your insights into the World Championships and good luck at those races. And um, yeah, good luck with the rest of the season. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. And that's the episode. It's written and edited by me, Matthew Piaro. I had help from web editors Terry McCall and Lily Hansen-Gillis. The podcast is produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music, too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you for listening. Please rate and review the show, ride safely, and I'll talk to you later.